So today we will continue on the second part of the overview of the kings of Israel from the 10th king for King Jehu to the 19th king, King Hosea. In our reference material, we will uh, be covering uh, from chapter 22 of uh, book 5 from the mysterious and profound providence of God Right, this, uh, sorry, chapter 22, part 5 from book 4 of the history of redemption. Okay? So this will be our materials. And our lesson outline, we will cover the chronology of the 19 kings. Actually, the second part, the first part, I already covered the first to the ninth. Now we'll carry on with the 10th to the 19th. And also we'll talk about the redemptive administration in the history of the northern kingdom. So this, is, uh, this can be found in the book itself, all right, um, where all the kings are stated, yeah, the, the years that they reign from the time. And this is also a very elaborate uh, uh, chart depicting all the, the kings, the 19 kings throughout the dynasties, nine dynasties in uh, the Northern Kingdom. So let us pray. Our Father, our gracious and loving God, Father, we come before you this evening to give you thanks and praise for all your goodness and your kindness that you have shown to each and every one of us. Lord, we acknowledge you as our sovereign God who rules and reigns in each and every one of our lives. This evening, as we come before you, Lord, as the body of Christ, we want to honor you and to glorify your holy name. For Lord, you have been always a good, good father to us. And this evening as we study your word, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to receive all that you will impart to us your wisdom, your knowledge, and the perfect understanding of your word. Father, we pray that even as I speak, that the Holy Spirit, Lord, will use me mightily to express, to reveal your truth clearly and simply so that we may understand, not in head knowledge, but Lord, to keep it in our hearts, and also to act it out in love, to love you first of all, and to love others as we love ourselves. So Father, we thank you for this time, and we want to commit everything into the mighty hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and praise. We give you all the honor and all the glory in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, with thanksgivings in our hearts. Amen. Okay, let us briefly recap the last lesson. Um, the time period was actually from 930 BC to 840 BC. And there were four dynasties that was covered out of nine. And the kings that we, we, we talk about, uh, Jeroboam, Nadab, which is the first dynasty, Basha, Elah, the second dynasty, uh, Zimri, the third dynasty, and of course, Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, and Joram, which is the fourth dynasty. And during that time also, God sent prophets like Ahijah, a man of God, Jehu, Elijah, uh, Micaiah, Elisha, right? And the, the, the theme that was actually covered um, during the last lesson was uh, basically about the enduring love of God and the wickedness and, our, and unrepented hearts of the northern Israel kings. So last uh, time we covered the nine dynasties. So this time we will go on from the fifth right up to the nine dynasties. And we'll cover the falling kings from the 10th to the 19th king. 
Now, during this period in the Northern Kingdom, the Nine Dynasties, it was a, a repeat of a, a vicious cycle, a cycle of murder, retribution, chaos, instability. People have lost their spiritual focus. They stumble and fall. They worship idols. They commit adultery, sexual perversion. And as a result, they went into poverty and great suffering. And in the words of Hosea, they made kings, but not through me. They set up princes, but I knew it not. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. So this was a continuous repeat cycle in the nine dynasties. However, in God's kingdom, it's also a repeat cycle of love, grace, mercy, and not to forget, justice. God's enduring love is embedded in His grace and in His mercy. What God seeks? God seeks repentance from His people. But sadly, as we know, the people did not repent. And God's justice was finally meted out for the unrepentance. In Isaiah 61, Verse 8 says, For I, the Lord, loves justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. So last uh, lecture, um, we are focusing a lot about God's love. But this lecture, I would like you to turn your focus to God's judgment. God is love, but God is also just and holy. And a just and holy God will not let sin go unpunished. So we'll move on to the 10th king, King Jehu. What does Jehu mean? It means he is the Lord. The Lord is he. King Jehu reigned for 28 years, and his evaluation was a wicked king. Right during this period, the key events that King Jehu did was actually completely destroying the house of Ahab. He was the first king of the fifth dynasty. Now, Jehu's anointing. Jehu was actually a servant of King Ahab's household. He killed King Joram, the fourth king of the fourth dynasty, and became the first king in the fifth dynasty. God made him king in order to fulfill God's judgment on Ahab's house. As we can see in 2 Kings 9, verse 6 to 10. So he arose and went into the house, and a young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel, and you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants and the prophets and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male born or free in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. 
Then he opened the door and fled. So Jehu was anointed for a sole purpose, that is to completely wipe out the house of Ahab according to God's prophecy. And what did he do? Jehu's path of destruction. He killed Joram. He killed Jezebel, who is the wife of Ahab. He killed 70 sons of Ahab. Great men of Ahab, valor men, friends, even the priests of Ahab, and all his household members. Now, not only he killed um, Ahab's household, but he also killed King Ahaziah of southern Judah because he was also related to the household of Ahab. And all his 42 relatives and the prince of Judah. But the biggest uh, religious reformation that he undertook was to kill all the Baal worshippers. So the Bible did not state how many, but uh, it could be in the thousands. Because when Elijah wiped out, there were 450 prophets of Baal during that time. So you can imagine how many followers they must have. All right. So now King Jehu, he followed the sinful ways of Jeroboam. He worshipped the golden calf at battle. And then, as in Kings, 2 Kings 10, verse 29, but Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. Not only that, he also did not keep God's law. As in 2 Kings 10, 31, but Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the king of Israel, with all his hearts, he did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. And he also made Israel to sin like Jeroboam did. Now, this is a, a grave sin because not only did he sin against God, but he turned the entire nation to sin against God. So what was God's judgment on Jehu? God did send oppression during this time from the Arameans. And while he was um, having this war with the king of Syria, King Azael, he was defeated. And part of the land was cut off from him, right? Je ja another judgment that God made on Jehu was that his dynasty will end four generations after him. And it will end when his descendant, King Zechariah, who was actually murdered by Shalom. So what can we learn from this lesson? Although one may be used greatly by God, however, if one departs from the word of God and continues on the path of iniquity, God's judgment will surely fall on him. And that was the case of Jehu. God used him greatly to destroy the house of Ahab. But when he became prideful, he turned away from God and started to follow uh, the sins of Jeroboam. Likewise for us today, if God were to use us mightily in his works, be careful that we do not become too arrogant or proud because pride 
leads to destruction. Jehoaz. Now he's the 11th king, and the name means the Lord has scraps, the Lord sustains. Now he reigns for 17 years, and he was also evaluated as a wicked king. The second king in the fifth dynasty, the key events that he did was actually to sought God's help in repelling the Arameans, and God delivered him even though he did evil. Now, Jehoaz, he did evil and received God's punishment because he followed the sins of Jeroboam, and God's anger burned against him. And this is recorded in 2 Kings 13, verse 3. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, continually. Okay, so it's not just for a period, but continually throughout his reign, he faced oppressions from the king of Aram. And throughout his reign, God punished him by allowing the Arameans to oppose the Israelites. And this is found in 2 Kings 13 verse 4. Then Jehoash sought the favor of the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, how the king of Syria oppressed them. Jehoaz sought after God and was delivered from oppression. Now, this deliverer is historically recorded as Adad Nirari III, who rules from 810 to 783 BC. He is the king of Assyria, and he attacked Damascus, the capital of Aram, and weakened the kingdom of Aram. So King Jehoaz actually took this opportunity to escape from the hands of the Arameans. So this is found in 2 Kings 13, 4 to 5. Then Jehoaz sought the favor of the Lord. And the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel. How the, kings, the king of Syria oppressed them. Therefore, the Lord gave Israel a savior so that they escaped from the hand of the Syrians and the people of Israel live in their homes as formerly. Now, what was the reasons for God's intervention? Now, God is a gracious God indeed. And God always welcome back uh, backsliders, people who have turned away from the Lord, God still would want them to come back to Him when they repent and seek His help. Likewise for us, sometimes we do sin. And when we repent and turn back to God, God will still embrace us with His love. So the reason for God's intervention Secondly, was also because of God's promise to Jehu. Now, God promised that Jehu's dynasty will last four generations after him. And God has actually kept his word. And this is all because of God's covenant to Abraham, right? The, the covenant that he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. And God remembers all this covenant. And so... He did not punish or kill Jehoaz immediately, but allow him still to rule and reign for a number of years before judgment was passed on him. Now, God used the Arameans to oppress the people as a way to discipline Israel 
throughout his reign. Can you imagine for 17 years, right, they've been oppressed all the days of their lives. And oppression, as you know, is not uh, something that we really want to see in our lives. But that was the case because of his disobedience to God. And God also imposed greater hardships than before on him after he did evil again. His, all, his whole army was destroyed except for a mere small peacekeeping force. Now, after Jehoash sought after God and God gave him relief from the oppression, but soon he turned again and rebelled. And this time, God sent even a greater force to wipe out, well, almost, right? His whole, whole army was actually wiped out except for a small force to maintain peacekeeping in the kingdom. So how sad it is, right? The lesson is do not test God. Those who have who had repented before God but continues to sin again will receive even greater sufferings. As in 2 Peter 2 verse 20, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. So this serves as a very good reminder for us not to test God's patience. Do not treat God's grace in vain. Indeed, God has given him great grace, right? He sinned, turned back to God. God accepted him. God embraced him delivered him from the oppression, and yet he sinned again. Grace was bestowed, but he did not treasure it, and he took it for granted, and as a result, God punished him. Joash, the 12th king, meaning is the Lord is strong, or given by the Lord. So he was the next king, and he reigned for 16 years. His evaluation is also a wicked king. The third king in the fifth dynasty, what was his key events? Well, he recovered the cities of Israel that his father had lost during their war with the Arameans. Now, during uh, Elisha's um, sickness and he was on his deathbed, King Joash went to visit him. And he wept over Elisha at his sickbed. This is found in 2 Kings 13, verse 14. Now, when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Now, Elijah was like the defense minister of the kingdom, and he has helped the kingdom in their battles against the Arameans. And now he's about to die. And King Joash went to visit him. And even at his deathbed, he prophesies. King Joash, that Israel will have victory over the state of Aram. And this is found in 2 Kings 13, verse 17. And he said, open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, 
For you shall fight the Syrians in Apek until you have made an end of them. So the arrows shooting out prophesies indicates that they will win over their war against the Syrians. But Joash struck the ground three times only. Elijah told him to get the arrows and hit it on the ground. And sadly, he only hit the ground three times. If he had hit five, ten times, God would actually completely destroy the Arameans for him. But that was not the case. And this is found in 2 Kings 13 verse 18. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. So this also goes to show the zeal of uh, Joash, right? He was not really that keen in completely destroying the kingdom of Syria. If he had been, he would forcefully strike and pound the arrows on the ground many, many times until Elijah tells him to stop. But he only did three times. Yet still God fulfilled that prophecy, as we will see. Now, he recovered the lost cities of Israel, which his father actually lost. And he did triumph over the kingdom of uh, Syria three times. And that was it. Right? But during those three times, he did manage to recover some of the lost cities that was lost in their war with the king of Aram. And this can be found in 2 Kings 13, verse 25. Then Jehoash, the son of Jehoiash, took again from Ben Hadad, the son of Hazil, the cities that he had taken from Jehoash, his father, in war. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. Now, another thing that uh, Joash did was actually defeating King Amaziah of southern Judah. Now, again, God used him to punish this southern uh, king because Amaziah, after he defeated the Edomites, he in fact brought back the idols and he worshipped the idols of the Edomites. So because of this, God punished him. And uh, this can be found in 2 Chronicles 25, 20. But Amaziah would not listen, for it was of God, in order that he might give them into the hand of their enemies, because they had sought the gods of Edom. So God used Joash to punish Amaziah. And Joash actually gained a great victory. This is found in 2 Kings 14, verses 13 to 14. And Joash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, son of Azahiah, at Beth Shemesh, and came to Jerusalem and broke down the walls of Jerusalem for 400 cubits from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. And he seized all the golds and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house, also hostages, and he returned to Samaria. So he not only captured the king, but he also destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Right? He broke down the, the, the walls, 400 cubits. He seized all the golds, all the silver, and took them home, and also the hostages he captured. So that was a great defeat that God actually gave to Joash. However, God still judged on Joash because like his fathers, they too, he too actually followed the sins of Jeroboam. 
So God continues to cause the Arameans to oppress the Israelites because of Joash's lack of zeal for victory, even after he defeated them three times. Right? Like it was mentioned, he only pounded on the ground three times. If he had done more, he would have completely wiped out the army of the Syrians. And Joash died a tragic death as he did evil in the sight of God and follow all the ways of Jeroboam. So what is our lesson? God can take away one's blessings when one departs from God's ways. Right? God actually gave tremendous blessing to him, but he did not seize on it. He decided to depart away from God. He didn't want to rely on God anymore. Likewise, God can give us tremendous blessings in our lives, but if we depart, God can also take it away from us. Now, we can trust in God's mighty power to help us overcome our enemy. Right? Sometimes our enemy may be too strong for us to overcome, but if we trust in God's mighty power, we can climb over a mountain, scale over a wall, cross over a river. If God is with you, who can be against us? God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Pride comes before a fall, and it's always very dangerous when we are powerful, when we are prideful, then we tend to lose God of ourselves. And that's the time when the devil will come to tempt us. And if we are not careful, and if we are not following the ways of God and being obedient to God's word, it is easy for us to fall. Jeroboam II, the 13th king, fourth king in the fifth dynasty, and what does his name mean? The people prosper, the people increase. He reigned for 41 years. In fact, twice more than the first Jeroboam. He was evaluated as the wicked king. Key events, the longest reigning king in Israel, restored Israel territory to the days of King Solomon. Now, he captured land as far as the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea. And this is found in 2 Kings 14.25. Uh, it was a time of prosperity as the land and the people increased. Right? For 41 years, he enjoyed tremendous uh, peace and power, right? and people also began to increase, the land increased. He was able to take back the land that they lost to the Arameans um, to the point where it was actually the time of Solomon, which was actually the biggest uh, land area that uh, Israel had ever occupied in their history. And also during this time, although it was a time of uh, prosperity, and, um, and the, actually the prosperity was only the, the, the noble, nobles, the kings that enjoyed, but not the people, as we shall see later. And during this time, God sent three prophets. I mean, one prophet is already serious enough, but three prophets during the 41 years. It must be really God's grace to ensure that he repent. But sadly, Jeroboam II did not. So this is uh, the land that he actually occupied during his reign. Now, God's providence was involved in ensuring that Jeroboam had this abundance. Right? God's compassion for the afflicted Israelites. And I've said the kings actually enjoy the abundance, but not the people, right? They have summer houses, 
winter houses, all the luxuries in their life, but they oppress the people. So in 2 Kings 14, 26, for the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, and there was none left, born or free, and there was none to help Israel. And God's, because of God's faithfulness to his covenant with Abraham, in 2 Kings 14, 27, but the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. And also in 2 Kings 13, verse 23, but the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them, and he turned towards them because his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from their presence until now. So God saw the afflictions and God help to release that oppression. So, God's judgment on Jeroboam II, what was the reasons for God's judgment? Because like I've mentioned earlier, only the leaders enjoyed the abundance, but not the people. And this is found in Amos uh, chapter 3, verse 15, chapter 6, verse 4 to 6. The leaders oppressed the poor and the needy. Right? This is found in Amos 2, uh, verse 6 to 7, verse, chapter 4, verse 1, and chapter 8, verse 4. There was rampant violence against those who uphold justice and righteousness. Those who speak against the king, he destroy. Those who live righteously, right, and tell the kings that they have done wrong, he destroy. And also the people, they committed sexual perversion, right? Father and son having the same woman, practicing adultery, which was so rampant throughout the land. And God completely destroyed Jehu's dynasty during Jehoboam's, the second son, Zechariah's reign. Now this is fulfilling God's prophecy as he has told Jehu that his kingdom will have four generations after him to sit on it. And true enough, after the reign of Jerob Jeroboam II, his son, Zechariah, fell. What is the lesson from this? God's eyes are on the righteous, but his face is against those who do evil. Right? God's eyes are watching to and fro. Everything we do, we say, he knows. Right? You know, getting up, you know, sitting down, God knows everything, and there is nothing to hide from his eyes. God can give and God can take away. Likewise, with the blessings that we have been bestowed, we have to treasure it because at any time, if we disobey the word of God, he can take away that blessing. What may look good on the outside may not be so on the outside, on the, on the inside. Yes, the land seems to be very prosperous, right? People increase land increase, but yet it was only for the rich and the noble. The people were oppressed. So what about us? When we go to a church every Sunday, does it mean that we are trying to look good on the outside, but deep inside we still harbor a lot of sins? So we have to be careful when we project ourselves, it must be sincere, right? Not to show good on the outside, but inside full of rottenness. The 14th king, and this is the fifth king in the fifth dynasty, Zechariah. And his name means the Lord remembered. The Lord remembers. Now he reigned only for a short period of six months and he was evaluated as a wicked king. Key events of his reign, house of Jehu fell during his reign. Um, shortest dynasty, I mean shortest reign in the fifth dynasty, right, as in found in 2 Kings 15 verse 8, 
in the thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reigned over Israel in Samaria six months. And he was killed by Shalom brutally, as found in 2 Kings verse 15:10. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck him down at Iblim and put him to death and reigned in his place. Struck him down, this phrase actually indicates brutal killing. And he also was a servant of uh, Zechariah, but yet he conspired and killed the master. So what was God's prophecy? Uh, in fact, God's prophecy was fulfilled. Uh, Zechariah's death was a result of the fulfillment of God's words to Jehu. This is found in 2 Kings 15 verse 12. And also because he committed evil in the sight of God by following the ways of Jeroboam the first. This is found in 2 Kings 15 verse 9 to 10. So what was God's judgment on Zechariah? He died a brutal death. He was the end to Jehu's dynasty of 89 years. I mean, can you imagine you being the king that is expected to carry on the kingdom, but yet you are the one that God punished to destroy the kingdom. So God's word will always be accomplished without fail. As in Isaiah, Isaiah 55 verse 11, my words will go out and will not return to me void, but will accomplish every word I send out, and it will be fulfilled. And this is the prophecy that God fulfilled during Zechariah's time, because God also remembers his covenant, the covenant that he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the 15th king, Shalom, his meaning means reward or retribution or peace. He reigned only one month, and his evaluation was a wicked king. Key events, he conspired to seize the throne. But he was the first king of the sixth dynasty. He made no achievement, actually, throughout his one month reign. He actually was known for his conspiracy in the Bible. And this is found in 2 Kings 15, verse 15. And he reaped what he saw, right? Just as he brutally killed his uh, master, Zechariah, he was also brutally killed by Menahem. And this is found in 2 Kings 15, verse 14. So what was God's judgment on Shalom? Well, like I've said, he was judged because he reaped what he saw. He brutally killed Zechariah. In the end, he was also brutally killed by Menahem. The lessons that we learn from him is that God is our rewarder, right? God holds rewards for every good things that we do for him, that he uses us in his kingdom, and he will reward us. But at the same time, God also repays according to our evil works, to those who do evil against him, right? So whatever we do is being judged, good or bad. The 16th king, Menahem, is the first king of the seventh dynasty. His name means the consoler, the comforter. He reigned for 10 years. Evaluation, again, wicked king. Now, key events, reliance on Assyria that brought his downfall. Now, this was organized for the first time in history um, by Reverend Abraham Park, that uh, Menahem actually became king on two accounts, right? And this is found in, the first time is found in 2 Kings 15 verse 14, 
And the second time is in 2 Kings 15, verse 17. Now, Menahem actually, he relied on man and not on God, as in 2 Kings 15, verse 19. Pool, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pool a thousand talents of silver that he might help him to confirm his hold on the royal power. Now, Menahem has used, um, in fact, um, outside power to gain control of his people and to seek on the throne, right? He paid tremendous amount of money to the Assyrian king so that he can hold on to this power. And what was God's judgment on him? He was also, ex- he was, uh, he was extremely brutal, right? He taxed the people heavily in order to procure the help of the Assyrians to sit on the throne. And he did evil in the sight of God and followed the sins of Jeroboam the first throughout his days. That means throughout his reign, he followed the ways, the sins of Jeroboam. And what is the lesson for us to learn? That those who rely on worldly powers bear tragic consequences. Now, in this, in this world, there are superpowers. And in history, we see one superpower emerge, and for a period of time, they fall. So no superpower can remain forever, except the only superpower of God. So if we rely on the wrong power, we get the wrong results and bear the consequences. Um, number 17 is Pekahiah. His meaning is the Lord has opened, the Lord has opened the eyes. He reigned for two years. His evaluation is also a wicked king. What is his key events? He built a citadel to his own doom. Uh, this is found in 2 Kings 15, verse 25. And Pekah, the son of Remalia, his captain, conspired against him with 50 men of the people of Gilead and struck him down in Samaria, in the citadel of the king's house with Agrop and Ariel, and he put him to death and reigned in his place. So his time was spent building um, this uh, citadel to protect himself, right? Because he was probably afraid that people might conspire against him. And indeed, people conspired against him. And he put his trust on man rather than on God. He trusted that what he built can protect him. He trusted that his his uh, right-hand man, his commander, can protect him. But in the end, his trusted fortress, his trusted man, turned and conspired and struck him down. So God's judgment on him, he was killed by the things that he trusted upon, on the citadel and on his servants. Lesson for us is that God is our true fortress and refuge. There is no one else. We may find that things may protect us for a period of time, but it can never truly protect us forever. Man judge the outward appearances, but God looks at the heart. Now, many a times we always like to judge a book by its cover. We see a person and we look at his um, appearance is nice. We, we may feel that, oh, maybe I, I can trust him. You know, he looks good. He looks a trustworthy person. But then deep down, we don't know what is inside their hearts. So it is, it is 
uh, imperative uh, that we mix around with people that truly are believers, believers in God. Pekka, the 18th king. This is the first king in the 8th dynasty. His name means open eyes and opening. He reigned for 20 years, but actually he reigned uh, 8 years because there was some overlap during his reign with uh, Menahem and uh, Pekiah. His key events, he killed his southern Judah brothers and later was himself slaughtered by the Assyrians. Now, Pika lasted for power with his open eyes. He probably saw what power can do in Pekahiah and wanted that power for himself. So when, when, when he lasted, when he saw the power that, that, that the previous king had, he wanted that power for himself and he conspired to kill him. So he also had a, an eye for diplomatic policy. He allied with King Aram to attack southern Judah king Ahaz. And that was actually a great mistake that he did. Because at that time, a new power was arising, and it was the Assyrians. And King Ahab actually um, asked for help from the Assyrians, and the Assyrians actually came to attack them, to attack uh, Pekka. And he lost the northern regions around Galilee, with many men taken captives as a result of his war with the Assyrians. Just like um, relying on the wrong power does have judgmental consequences. What was God's judgment on Pekka? He killed, struck down by his servant, Hosea, who conspired against him. So the lesson, pride comes before the fall. When we become powerful, there is a tendency for us to lose our God, and that's a danger for us to fall during that times. Now, our eyes should be open towards heavenly treasures and not earthly gains. Yes, nothing in this world lasts. So if we were to rely on perishable things on earth, it will perish. But if we fix our eyes on the treasures of heaven, if we live our life for God, we accumulate good deeds, we accumulate uh, the things of God. These are the things that last forever. And lastly, the last king, King Hosea, the first king of the Nine Dynasty, his name means Lord or save us. And he reigns only nine years. Evaluation is a wicked king as well. And sadly, under him, under his reign, the northern kingdom of Israel perished. Why? Because Hosea relied on the wrong power. He was pro-Assyrian while he killed Pekka, but he turned his alliance later towards Egypt, a waning power. So northern Israel actually perished under his reign. This happens when uh, Salmanasa the fifth besieged Samaria during Hosea's seven years reign, but then he died, and his son, Sargon II, took over, and in Hosea's ninth year, the kingdom was completely destroyed, the city of Samaria, and the Israelites were taken captives, and foreign nations were brought into the land. God's judgment on Hosea, he was remembered as the king who lost the northern kingdom of Israel. 
which lasted for 208 years from 930 BC to 722 BC through 19 kings under nine dynasties by the hands of the Assyrians in 722 BC. What is the lesson that we learn from him? Departure from God leads to ultimate destruction. So be careful when we walk with the Lord, we must be steadfast in our walk with him if we lose our steps it leads to ultimate destruction true faith requires obedience trust and reliance on the omnipotent one right our strength and our might does not come from us it is bestowed upon us by the grace of god so let us always truly believe and trust in god and his word and to rely on Him in whatever that we do or say. Unrepentant hearts invites punishments and judgments from God. Throughout the whole history of the northern Israel, God's grace has been bestowed upon them for 208 years. Prophets after prophets He sent to warn them, but yet it turned on deaf ears and they would not repent. Like I've said, God is just and holy, and He will not let sin go unpunished. And that was the result of the northern kingdom of Israel. They did not repent, and they did not turn away from their evil ways, but continue in it. And they were struck off from history. Now, as we come to the end of the uh, characteristics and uh, evaluations of the kings, uh, let's take a look at the redemptive administration in the history of the northern kingdom. Now, God actually declared northern Israel as his people based on the Davidic covenant. Now, after Solomon's death, the kingdom was actually divided into southern Judah and northern Israel. And southern Judah was ruled by Solomon's son, Rehoboam, with the support of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Jeroboam ruled northern Israel with the support of the other ten tribes of the north. So God still declared northern Israel as his people, still based on the Davidic covenant. And this is found in 1 Kings 11.38. And if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David, my servant, did. I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David. And I will give Israel to you. So the Lamb of God was still with them even though the kingdom have split. But the sins of Jeroboam, the first king, triggered down to the 19th king, the last king, right? This sin of making golden calves at battle and then building high places and worshipping Baal and Asherah. God gave warnings to prophets. He sent 11 prophets throughout this period of 208 years to warn of their sins and the impeding judgment if they refused to repent. And in 2, 2 Kings 13, 23, it says, when the, But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them, and he turned towards them, because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, nor has he cast them from his presence until now. So God still had hope in saving, not in Israel, but continuous rejection, rejections of God's warning brought inevitable fall of the kingdom, and the kingdom fell to the Assyrians in 722 BC. 
And in 2 Kings 17, verse 22, 23, the, word, the people of Israel walked in all the sins that Jeroboam did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had spoken by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. Now, what was the reasons for the northern Israel destructions? They burn incense and they worship idols, as found in 2 Kings 17, 11 to 12. And there they made offerings on all the high places, as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger, and they saved idols, of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. They did not heed the prophets, nor their warnings. In 2 Kings 17, verse 13, 14, Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every shear, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I have commanded your fathers and I have sent to you by my servant the prophets. But they would not listen. But they were stubborn as their fathers had been who did not believe in the Lord their God. They forsook the law, covenant, and the word of God. 2 Kings 17 verse 15. They despised his statutes and his covenant and he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false idols and became false and they followed the nations that were around them concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should do, that they should not do like them. Now, in conclusion, for 208 years, God's grace and mercy have been extended to the northern kingdom, reminding dynasties after dynasties, kings after kings, not to forsake God, nor his law and his covenant, but repeatedly the kings and the people refused to heed his voice. Not only that, they also did what was abomination in God's sight by worshipping idols, oppressing the poor and the needy, practicing violence, and committing sexual perversion. Darkness was rampant throughout this period. Finally, God could not leave their sins unpunished. And with the destruction of northern Israel, their land was completely put out. The destruction of northern Israel was not an injustice of God. In fact, it is a righteous judgment. God had patiently waited for them to repent Many times, the cries of prophets Hosea, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity, except what is good, and we will pay with bulls and vows of our lips. This demonstrated God's enduring love for their rebellious ways. The northern Israel kingdom fall was a result of their own sin and disobedience, paving the way for their destruction. And God's judgment came as in 2 Kings 17, 22, 23. The people of Israel walk in all the sins that Jeroboam did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had spoken by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. Now the main theme of history of redemption 
uh, creation, the fall, restoration, and final consummation. As we progress in our lessons in the series, we will learn how the sinful nature of man ultimately needs a savior to redeem them from their fallen state. Although the northern kingdom was destroyed, yet God ensured that the Lamb of the Covenant remains unquenchable through the line of Judah, where ultimately the Messiah, our Lord Jesus, would come to save mankind. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 to 12, now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Today, as we study the lesson, let us reflect upon our own lives. Are there any areas where sins still dominate? Have we repented and turned back to our gracious Lord to seek forgiveness? Is God still sovereign over our lives? Or are we still our own king? Now, if God were to evaluate us today, how will his assessment of us look like? What kind of legacy will you leave behind? And how will you want to be remembered when you run out of date here on earth? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father in heaven. Lord, we stand before you and admit the Lord, we are all sinners and we have committed great transgressions against you. But Lord, because of your grace and your mercy, you have sent your, our Lord Jesus Christ to die on a cross to shed his blood for the remissions of our sins. For those who believe in him, Lord, you have taken away our iniquities and you have forgiven of us of our sins. Lord, we thank you for this lesson that you have taught us. How, by your grace, your love that is embedded in your grace and in your mercy, that you have shown to the northern kingdom of Israel. And yet being a rebellious and stubborn people, they did not heed your advice. Likewise, Lord, help us not to be stubborn nor rebellious towards you and your word. By your grace, may the Holy Spirit Convict us and help us to repent of our sins that we may turn to you to receive your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your truth, for your principles. And may the Holy Spirit give us a spirit of obedience that we may follow your ways, that we may tread on the path that you have foreordained for each and every one of us according to your plans and your purpose for our lives. So help us, Lord, to walk the path that you will lead. Let your light so shine on us that we may reflect not only your light, but also your love to those people that we may meet or teach. 
Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We give you thanks and praise. We give you all the honor and all the glory. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, with thanksgivings in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you.